Like so many of us, I'm more and more alarmed about climate change. I love humans and I love the natural world. I think they could make a great couple and it upsets me that it's so hard for the two of them to get along. I wanted to understand why and what, if anything, I could do to help get them back together. So two years ago, knowing nothing about climate change, I grabbed a bunch of books, but I'm not a scientist or even a technologist. So honestly, the books put me right to sleep. I'm an artist, I'm a playwright. I like dialogue, I like conversations. So rather than read 100 books about climate change, I decided to have 100 conversations. I reached out to experts in sea level rise, methane emissions, plastic pollution, climate models, every topic that came up in conversation with my family and friends. I learned some important things. For one, climate experts are incredibly generous with their time. These were professors from the Harvard Kennedy School, Columbia Climate School, MIT, Stanford, Caltech, scholars from the National Labs and the IPCC, policymakers, artists, activists, busy people who each gave me an hour of their time for a conversation about the work they do and why. I asked what scares them the most about climate change, and almost never did they say the heat or the storms or the waves of extinction, starvation, and war. What scares these experts more than anything else is human apathy. What scares them is our own collective perception that nothing can be done. Instead, they insisted over and over that we have the tools already at our disposal to address the worst of the problems we face if we can shake off our apathy and use them. We have tools for a better electricity grid, tools to save species and habitats, tools to secure our supplies of food and medicine and water, and of course, lots of tools for clean energy, which is the only way out of the mess we made. I didn't go into the project looking for a single solution, and of course, there isn't one. But one thing did keep coming up as an incredible lever for change, a particular form of clean energy. And after all of these conversations with all of these experts, I'm really convinced that we can't fight climate change without it. But before I tell you what it is, let me give you a bit of background. So the kind of energy we need depends on what we need it for. Solar and wind are absolutely fantastic for certain situations, but even with battery backup, they can't provide what grid operators call baseload power which is power that's available at a steady rate 24 seven and all year. Right now we get most of our baseload power from coal and a lot of natural gas with devastating effects for the climate and for human health. The clean alternatives are hydroelectric, geothermal, hydrogen, nuclear fusion, and nuclear fission. Hydroelectric is fantastic, but it's not practical in places that are flat or dry. I've got friends in Kansas and that just won't work for them. Geothermal, hydrogen, and nuclear fusion, also terrific, but each still requires big breakthroughs in technology, materials, and infrastructure before they can work at scale. Even with thousands of brilliant, devoted people pushing to make those breakthroughs, there's just no telling how long that work will take. And of course, with climate change, time is very tight. After all these conversations, what I learned is that what's ready right now, what can help us right now, what we already understand and use, is nuclear fission, usually of course just called nuclear. A lot of people still oppose nuclear for reasons that I'll talk about in a bit, but I first wanna describe a particular idea for nuclear energy, a particular kind of reactor that I first learned about in my 31st conversation with Dr. Jacopo Buongiorno, a professor at MIT who works on nuclear batteries, sometimes called fission batteries or micro reactors. These are similar in some ways to the big nuclear power plants that already provide almost 20% of the electricity on the US grid, except that nuclear batteries like this one can be small enough to fit in a shipping container. Professor Buongiorno pointed out that the US Navy has used miniature reactors like this one for decades to power its 11 aircraft carriers and 70 submarines. And whatever you think of aircraft carriers and submarines, the reactors on board have never had a single accident. Even at the size of a shipping container, a nuclear battery like this one can generate enough power for a thousand American homes, meaning that a community of 1,000 families could plug just one of these devices into their local substation, and for five years, it would power the dishwashers, refrigerators, water heaters, washers, dryers, and electric vehicles. After five years, the battery starts to run low, the community plugs in a fresh one, and the previous one goes back to the factory to be refueled. Honestly, I was skeptical. Could we really use these things to power American neighborhoods, 
towns, whole cities? Well, I learned it depends. There's certainly momentum in that direction. In the next five years, there are plans already in the works for them to power college campuses, remote mining communities, military bases, and to bring emergency power after natural disasters. 15 years ago, there were zero companies in the world attempting to build this size of reactor for civilian use. Today, by my count, there are 11 such companies with direct support from four of our national labs and hundreds of millions in government funding to help them succeed. To help them succeed at what? Well, the dream is to redefine the way we build reactors, to go from a world where every reactor is tailor-made to a world where we fabricate reactors very precisely in factories. Factories where they're built by the hundreds or thousands, slashing the cost of each one, slashing the cost of the energy they generate, making them the safest, most reliable, most versatile, least expensive sources of energy on Earth. When I say it depends, I mean it depends on public opinion. And public opinion about nuclear energy is complicated, to say the least, with real concerns across the realms of safety, waste, weaponization, and cost. My friends and family have these concerns. They ask about them. They worry about them. Maybe you do too. Again, I'm not a scientist, but I can tell you that the nuclear scientists I've talked to have been able to dispel those worries for me, often by explaining just how far the technology has come in the last 50, 60, 70 years. This isn't a talk about technology or even implementation, but if you're curious about this, I really encourage you to do some research on your own and to find out for yourself. So what does all this have to do with apathy about climate change? Well, I learned that the scientists are great at explanations, and those explanations bring a lot of clarity. But clarity isn't enough to combat apathy. We need people to get emotional. I think a lot about Heather Hoff and Kristen Zaitz, who started an organization called Mothers for Nuclear. They welcome conversations about nuclear energy that do get emotional. And that's key, I think, because those emotions govern not just what we fear, but what we allow ourselves to hope for. If in the next few years, Americans have heard of these devices, have understood the basics of how they work, which are not hard to explain, if they've encountered them in person in some form, and if they've been given a chance to consider and discuss them, and not just these reactors, but nuclear energy in general, then I think that dream of abundance could start to come true. So how do we do that? I used to work at the Sphere in Las Vegas. Our particular team designed games for the venue, games that 20,000 people in the same room could play at the same time. That turned out to be a hard challenge. We struggled with it for months, and what finally unlocked it for us was treating spectacle as a conversation, an emotional conversation. Spectacle doesn't make people passive, we realized. It's the opposite. Spectacle makes us curious, eager to engage. In the presence of a generous spectacle, thinking and feeling come together. You get the clarity of MIT with the emotion of Mothers for Nuclear. And I think you get an opportunity to tell a story about the future. Here's what I propose. This is the roving reactor project. It's an ambitious vision for an immersive traveling exhibit about nuclear energy with a focus on nuclear batteries. The structure here is 60 feet tall and animated with warm, welcoming light. At the center is a model of a nuclear battery appropriately housed inside of a shipping container. And to be clear, this isn't a functioning reactor, just a model, but that model is full size and it's packed with hands-on interactive exhibits for visitors of every age. It's exuberantly artistic, a spectacle designed to draw thousands of visitors and spark thousands of conversations at events like South by Southwest, the Daytona 500, the Minnesota State Fair, Comic-Con. Remember I said that with public opinion on their side, the batteries could start to come to American neighborhoods within 10 years. The roving reactor is a 10-year project designed to see that happen. For the first five years of the project, we bring the exhibit to these iconic gatherings. For the second five years, it travels to the individual communities that by then are considering nuclear energy for themselves. Everywhere it goes, it's an event. With music, food, town hall meetings, it provokes conversation. It attacks our apathy by offering an up-close, hands-on vision of what's possible if we take a fresh look at nuclear energy. 
The big interactive exhibits in the tent are relentlessly rooted in the science, but not tentative or unemotional about what the science makes possible for human flourishing and for the flourishing of the earth. And this is the moment. We know from polling that support for nuclear energy is on the rise, with an incredible 56% of Americans now in favor. But it's quiet support. It's shy. 57% tells me, though, that Americans, everyday Americans, are ready to hear the case for nuclear energy. This project is a way to make that case with passion and panache. People across the nuclear energy ecosystem are already doing incredible work on things like federal funding, research, regulatory reform, workforce development, fuel supply. This is different. This is about creating a groundswell of public support, flipping the switch from apathy to attention, not with books or movies or podcasts as important as they are, but with direct contact, contact with the technology and contact with experts on hand to have real emotional conversations. If we can't take millions of people to see a reactor, let's take a reactor to millions of people. So what does success look like for the project? I can think of three metrics. One, media coverage for nuclear energy turns a corner with a fresh focus on the facts and opportunities. Two, political candidates at every level up to the president put nuclear power at the center of their campaigns and agendas precisely because millions of their constituents are insisting on the good that it can do. Three, individual communities begin to volunteer to host their own nuclear power plants, small, medium, or large. But all that only happens if, as a nation, we can see the technology up close and acknowledge our fears, even as we consider a future where those fears have been sincerely dispelled, dispelled even to the satisfaction of today's naysayers. It's an ambitious vision, so I think it's worth taking a second to talk about how we get it done. I've started by assembling a board of advisors. You'll see Professor Buongiorno here, you'll see the Mothers for Nuclear, you'll see folks from the Smithsonian and South By, as well as activists, policy experts, artists, and architects. This coming year is about building a deep and wide community around the project. To be clear, these logos do not imply that these folks are already on board. This is a wish list, but it's not just a bunch of logos. It's a process plan in the form of a credibility ladder. The first step on the ladder is to get a grant for the project from every one of the organizations in this top row. That grant can be $5. What matters is that the project can demonstrate support from advocates, communicators, educators, museum directors, policy teams, and so on. That's the first layer. It's early days. So far, we've gotten grants from Generation Atomic and Mothers for Nuclear, and I'm in the process of reaching out to friends at these other organizations. With those grants in hand, we'll reach out to the National Museum of Science and History, the National Labs, and the Smithsonian. I'll ask each of them for an official artist residency to work on the exhibits and the experience inside the big tent. Meanwhile, I'll loop back to academia and my contacts from the 100 Conversations and will organize a conference at one of these schools focused specifically on the project with representatives from all of these organizations in attendance. With these three layers of credibility, including direct partnerships with the National Labs, MIT, Smithsonian, I'm confident, absolutely confident, that the big events will commit to hosting the exhibit. South by, Daytona, etc. So again, a plan in the form of a ladder of credibility. And the final step, one year from now, is to approach big donors and philanthropists to fund the project. By then we'll have designs, detailed budgets, operational plans, and dozens of official endorsements and partnerships. Everything the project needs to be a success. Along the way, we'll film a documentary about designing and fabricating and touring this exhibit, which hopefully will go right into the Smithsonian itself when we're finished. During this first year, we'll build the website, we'll build out prototypes, we'll travel, but really this first year is about creating the community, aligning the people at these incredible organizations toward this shared goal. With that in place, I'm confident that the second phase of funding, building, and deploying the exhibit will get much, much easier. So what did I learn about why the humans in the natural world struggle so much to get along? 
Well, I learned it's not inevitable. I also learned from those conversations just how vital conversation itself can be. The conversation is the first antidote to apathy. This entire project is a crusade against apathy. It's my attempt to hear what these hundred experts on climate change were trying to tell me, what I think they're trying to tell you too, that we have the tools at our disposal to address the worst of the problems we face, but it's gonna take coordination and courage and honest conversations with each other, conversations inside this big tent and around the world. So thank you so much for your time.